Our mission at Confronting Domestic Violence, CDV, is to provide real-time resources to real-time victims and offer relocation services when parents have a safe place to go and not the means to get there. Every day, countless families wake up in fear, navigating a battleground in their own home, trapped in a cycle of violence. It is a known fact the most dangerous time for a victim is when the abuser knows they're leaving right up to the point of leaving. One of the biggest challenges a parent faces is fear and finances. So while we aim to help numerous families each month by fostering multi-agency collaborations, we're humbly asking you for your support too. Every little bit helps to make our mission a reality for families ready to leave their toxic, abusive environment. No parent should have to leave everything behind or result to homelessness when leaving for safety. Your contribution can make a world of difference in offering a family to feel safe at home once again. Hey, Garcia here. Thank you for tuning in to Confronting Domestic Violence. You know, what we talk about to here is raw, real. Sometimes it can be triggering. If you feel triggered, please turn the, the sound down, walk out, breathe, come back when you feel comfortable, or just tune us out completely. I just want to say that today I am honored to have Rita Smith here to not just share her story, but to share all the work that she's put in, to share her outlook, her inside knowledge, her wisdom, her journey. It is such an abundance of information and a wealth of knowledge. And she has been going at it for 40 plus years, really making an impact in the community for domestic violence and also leaving a legacy behind for, for future, for people like me that want to walk in those footsteps. And it is just an honor to be here uh, with her. So Rita, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Happy to be with you. Oh, thank you. Now we talked a little bit. Actually, let's talk about how we met. I found you online. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That internet thing. <laughs> yeah. So Rita and I connected about three years ago. I had just got out of um, the hospital. I had a 1% chance of surviving and realized in the ICU unit that confronting domestic violence needed to be in existence. So that's where it was born. When I came home, I was just looking to see who else is in the community, who can I speak to, how can I just really gain an understanding of how to get a nonprofit up and going and how I can help with, with the services in the community. And Rita was one of the very few, if not the only one that said, hey, call me when you get a little bit more established. I will not forget you and I do not forget where I came from and I want to help those that are getting started and that are serving the same purpose and mission. So I did exactly that about two and a half years later and I was like, Rita, oh my gosh, I have all this stuff going on. And sure enough, she has pointed me to domesticshelters.org and Rita, please talk to us a little bit about that because I know you're on the board. Yeah, I'm not on the board. I am. I work with them. I'm. It's. I'm a private consultant now. I have a couple contracts. One is with DomesticShelters.org. It's an online resource for survivors and advocates. It's a national directory listing for programs throughout the United States and Canada. So we do include Canadian transitional houses as well. And it's just a way. What we began to realize was that people were searching for domestic violence online. So many people were looking for information and like some crazy number, like 36 million searches kind of thing in a year, just tons of people, because that's how we try to find information. Now we go to the internet for it first. And so Teresa's fund out of Arizona is who started the process around putting an online directory in place. And just so people could search for where's their nearest program. Right. And, and it's expanded in just dramatic ways and that we have well over 1,200 original articles now on issues and topics that survivors might want and need, a, a way to really start to educate them about what's happening to them. Is it okay? Is it wrong? Is it abuse? Financial abuse? What happens when um, I leave and I have cust uh, custody issues? We just have got literally a thousand, over a thousand articles to try to help people understand what's happening to them and what the resources are. And what safety planning mean, what all the kinds of language things that people might use 
in our field to help people. It's to, to really help them understand where they are in the process and how they can safely start to seek help. So that's what domesticshelters.org is. And it's it became a, a resource as well for advocates and programs because we've tried to make it um, a resource that you can download widgets um, from our site that we have created that you can use and make your site look more robust and more because most programs don't have either the skill sets or the bandwidth or the money to pay for up, updating their um, website a lot. And so we've tried to to provide options for people to take some of the content off our site and put it on there so it looks like they're just rocking and rolling. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the things that I like best about it um, is that it's a place where you as an advocate can get help, not just uh, people who, who are um, being harmed, um, but that people who help those who are being harmed can also get resources there. So that that's what domesticshelters.org is. And I'm glad it's it feels like it's a resource for you because that that really matters to me as an advocate. That's something that that benefits you. Absolutely. And across the board, since the moment that we had reconnected and you told me about it, I, as the nonprofit, as the organization, I applied to be a part of that directory, which I was vetted and awarded the space to be in that directory. And I absolutely added that widget to my website. It is there. You could go to my website and see it right now. It is definitely there, which I loved that idea. So the second I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, right away. Because to <laughs> your point, it is, it does get costly and it's a lot of maintenance on a website to constantly have these updates. So I love the fact that it is uh, available to us and that it is a full-on directory of resources for the masses, whether you are a survivor, whether you're in that victim stage real time and or resource for the advocacy level. I use it myself. I'm not an advocate. I advocate for advocacy. But yeah, when I am speaking with real-time survivors on the phone and they're telling me their real needs and my services can't appease them for that moment, I definitely direct them there and have them on the upper right-hand corner, put in the zip code, your resources will pop up. So it has definitely been a huge, great addition for me and the people that I'm serving real-time. Yeah, That's thank great. you so much for that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Good to hear. Yeah. And then, so some other things that we were talking about, we've had plenty of conversations. We have a lot to talk about. We were, before we started recording, we were talking about the Violence Against uh, Women's Act. You were out there for the 30th uh, year of celebrating that being in its existence. And we were talking about how it started off as the first legislative bill being passed on a national level or a part of it back in 84, prior to it signing, being fully signed in in 94. And how you were a part, a, a huge instrumental part of getting that verbiage in there along with like multi-agencies and an influx of people showing up to really support this bill. Yeah, it was it, the first bill we got passed was the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act. That was in 84. And that was really just direct funding for programs, shelters, basically at the time. And it, as we got more informed by victims and survivors about what they were needing, we knew that we needed much more in terms of legislative support. We needed a bigger bill, much bigger bill to try to address these issues. And so started working across different groups, national groups that were doing this work to say, we need somebody to carry this bill. And we were fortunate enough that Senator Joe Biden at the time uh, was willing to do that. And so he became our champion and helped us write that bill and then move it forward through what is a very cumbersome process to get a bill passed in this country. It's just, it takes time and it's just problematic and you have to keep pushing buttons and you have to keep calling people. And so that, that first bill that got passed in 1994 was much, much bigger, so massive. The Violence Against Women Act, it, it it addressed domestic violence, dating violence and stalking and some sexual violence. But that first bill, we were not particularly good at expanding those resources for sexual violence. We have since remedied that problem. It is much, much more robust for sexual assault and those kinds of crimes. But but that, yeah, that first bill took a lot of people and we had a policy. I was the director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence for 20 of those 30 years. And we had a policy person who, who really worked very closely in DC with the senator and the other sponsors in the House to get the bill through the legislative process and then to the president to sign it. So that's been, that was a massive 
change agent in this country in many ways. It had not just funding for services, but it had training for law enforcement and prosecutors and resources for uh, discretionary funding for victims in different ways and housing. And it's just an expansive bill that really tries to start to address the the vast uh, myriad of issues that a victim would save trying to flee. So I think it's we've improved it every time we've had to reauthorize it. And it's a much better bill than it was in 94, but we still got things to do. So oh, yeah. <laughs> next time it comes up, it'll be bigger and different <laughs> again. So yeah. that's the goal. <clears throat> Are you, may I ask a direct question about VAWA? Okay. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the resources or protection or help that it offers for colleges and universities? Yeah, there's a specific grant program for, it's called Campus Safety Grant Program within the Violence Against Women Act. And so that money is specifically for programs either based on campus or programs in a college town who want safety work. And so it could be an, an outside agency that goes onto campus and does training for sexual assault and domestic violence for students and work with the Title IX offices in the, on those campuses to help them do a better job of responding when there are, there are crimes on campus. And so that's a very specific program, the campus safety. Yeah. And it's a really important piece because that there's just a lot of progress that's been made in that respect, but there's thousands and thousands of campuses all over the country. And so we've only probably had funding to to impact a few of them along the way. And yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I've interviewed quite a few students <clears throat> and I asked that question. You know, obviously I'm interviewing them because they have a story and mm -hmm. I ask questions about training or educating or access to phone numbers. What do, what's the chain of command? What's the communication channel? Do they know, do they have this? And most of the time the response is, you know, yeah, I think they touched on it during orientation like three years ago, but then yes. they don't know. They don't know. <laughs> and so much still happens on campus, but interesting. But that's why I definitely wanted to know more about the specific part of the bill that supports the schools directly, because it doesn't sound like it has anything to do with what the students should know. It sounds like it needs to be something that the schools need to be tapping into to provide the support that, or excuse me, to receive the support that it is that's offered through there as it relates to that actual like training component to that. It depends on what the grant applicant will put into their grant, but it, do, it, it is very much focused on creating programs to educate the students, to provide resources to the students. They might do it through the facet of working with like sororities and fraternities, for instance. Um, it just depends on what that local program uh, who wants to do it on a campus or the campus itself is trying to focus on, the areas that they want to use that money for. The, the fact that there's even a bit of information shared during orientation is because probably that we had that money and we started to get advocates connected to those university systems so they would know this is a problem. You need to address this problem now. You need to educate kids about what's what consent means. And that, that first, I think that first 90 days or something it is identified as the red zone area where things happen because kids are coming onto campus, they're just experiencing a lot more freedom than they've ever had before. And so trying to get them information about what's okay and what's not okay, and being careful about not leaving your drink around and, and having a group to watch out for each other, that just really simple ideas around that kind of thing, that kind of stuff is happening. A lot of it is due to the fact that uh, we put those kinds of resources for funding in the Violence Against Women Act so that those communities uh, could start to address the issues that were happening on campus. And good to know that they at least remember part of it, but I think it should be more frequent. I think it should be like an every year thing or there's refresher information that's available to students so they can remind themselves because it's just not top of their mind to stay focused on but refreshing them about what's safe and what's not is, I think, an important piece. And I just don't know how long 
the funding goes and whether it allows them to do it multi-year. Yeah. And I'm thinking wherever there's an evacuation sign is maybe where they should have emergency phone numbers. <laughs> Does that Everywhere. make too much sense? <laughs> Everywhere. There should be access to, to the numbers you need when you need them. <laughs> Seriously. Oh gosh. A few more things that I want to talk about as it relates to you and the, and all your hard work, wisdom, and legacy here that you're still building. <laughs> You were a part of the documentary for the O.J. Simpson, Nicole Simpson situation recently, yeah. huh? Is there yeah. anything that you can talk about now or we have to wait until it's until it's out? No, I think I think it probably aired at some point. I'm not sure. I think it might have been Lifetime television okay. had it on. Uh, but uh, when I saw, so I, again, I was the director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence in 1994. And in June of 1994 is when Nicole uh, Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were murdered. And O.J. Simpson was arrested for that. And and it, uh, it became the trial of the century, literally. It really did. I was talking to reporters from all over the country during that process, and even talk to Japanese and German television. It was just an international thing that people were focused on. And so it became a way for that horrible tragedy became a way for us in this field to educate people at a level we hadn't been able to before, because so many people were paying attention. There was so much media about it that advocates all over the country in their local, when we used to have more local news because we did 30 years ago, have more local news stations and local newspapers. They're not nearly as prevalent as they used to be, but you're they would be talking to their local newspaper about what resources are available in that city because so many people were watching the trial. And through the process of all of that, I, I, I met Denise Brown, uh, Nicole's sister. And and it, she would be at events that I was at because people would bring her in to speak. And so I got to know Denise pretty well. And she wanted to make sure that, <clears throat> I mean, it's the 30-year anniversary. In June, it was a 30-year anniversary of Nicole dying. And she wanted to do something to make sure that people knew who Nicole was because so much of the story had been about OJ. Mm -hmm. And so many people had covered it about him and she wanted to do something that was more focused on her and what her life was like and how much she tried to get away and to stay safe and she did she worked very hard at that but there was very little help for her because of the celebrity of of her abuser and that was their goal the brown family really wanted the documentary to be about who nicole was and what a what an amazing person she was, and that the loss was something that we should remember rather than ignore. Because when victims of domestic violence are murdered, that the story really becomes about the perpetrator more than it does about who they were and yeah. how hard they struggled to stay safe. Yeah, it was. I was more than happy to do that for them, and to, and hopefully whatever part I played in it, whatever they didn't edit out because I spent a lot of time talking to them, how they do filming. I don't know if you know that, but they film a lot. They get a lot of film and then there's 10 minutes of time that they <laughs> clip into something. And so I have no idea what parts of it they saved, but I'm hoping whatever it was to honor Nicole and recognize the strength that she had and the, the, the attempts she made to protect herself and her kids. Yeah. And I think that's a great segue to go into 20 years ago, I survived a double attempted homicide. I was eight months pregnant. I was over a thousand miles away from home. I had just relocated myself and my eight year old daughter at the time. And my abuser happened to be the father of my unborn child. And I was able to get him off of me in, in the grappling on the floor type of <laughs> situation, which woke up my daughter. And that, I think that's what gave me the strength, actually. And I just grabbed her little hand and we ran outside like that, uh, barefoot and in pajamas at about 11 o'clock at night. So I have boots on the ground, hands-on knowledge of really the devastation of having a life and then just being stripped away in a matter of minutes and then having nothing and trying to figure out, oh my goodness, 
what am I supposed to do? Nobody mm-hmm. really looks or understands what domestic violence is or what the resources are or what programs are available until you need them. And but and right. when you get to that space of needing them, oh my gosh. And we're talking about Nicole, what, 40 years ago, my situation 20 years ago. And today people are still in fear of speaking up about it, it's still considered a social stigma, especially for those with high titles or a lot of money. They typically will not speak on it. But with the times of today and a lot of things being accepted and put out there, there are more people coming forward. But just, sorry, I feel like I'm going off on a tangent here. I want to bring it back to safety and safety. For parents and children, I know that's one of your passions. That's what you, of all the work that you've done and everything that you're still doing, your primary focus is really, truly still all about the safety of parents and children. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was my, that would, that became my focus of my life. Yes. I, I did, wasn't like I had planned it, but I, in 1981, it's not like this could be a career because it was so new was an issue that very few people, we didn't have resources in, in a lot of places yet. And I happened to take a job as a counselor in a shelter for battered women. And in 1981, I think that the time I spent with them, the moms and the kids, their willingness to share what was happening to them, trusting me with that information, something just clicked for me. And it became the thing I wanted to make a difference in. And I've been fortunate to be able to do it as long as I have, but I am so grateful to those women and children who trusted me with their stories, who trusted me with their the worst thing that ever happened to them. Because it, it does take a great deal of courage to speak out loud about that because you never know what the response is going to be to you. And it's like a gift of the sharing that they've done with me because it, it took a great deal of courage for them to open up so grateful. You know, and when speaking from those shoes, when you are in transition from being a victim to realizing you were victimized, stepping into that survival journey, talking about it is almost like having to relive it. It brings back all of those senses and it becomes very difficult. And so my heart goes to those people that were able to open up and share too, because it takes a lot. And especially when you are, again, through that transition, right? Transitional space. And when you feel like you've done the work and you've talked about it enough and like the court things may be over, but then you are still talking about it. It it almost never goes away. It can fade. It can be a little more faded or not as clear. But when it comes time to like really share it all comes back like it was yesterday. For me, when I was in when I was in the courtroom and I was on the stand and I was testifying, when they brought him in his orange suit, uh, my strong voice of saying, yes, I'm going to let you know everything that happened. When he walked by and we made eye contact, I went like this and mm-hmm. I couldn't talk anymore. And I was saying to myself, what's going on? What's going on? Speak up, talk. I don't even know what happened. Maybe... I don't know. I can only say that maybe because he almost took my life and my unborn child's life, all of a sudden that fear was like instilled in me at that very moment that I saw those eyes again. Before Mm -hmm. that, in between that time, I was like, yeah. But then the moment that I was put in front of him, I was like, I just shrunk. The, the, The thing about abusers is that they are very skilled at making you believe something that's not true about you. They are very skilled at that. They manipulate your reality. They confuse you. They keep you in chaos so that trying to trying to stand up for yourself becomes almost impossible. That's right. But, you know, yeah, so that I just am so in awe of the many creative ways that women were able to find ways to fight back. Mm-hmm. that's not traditional, that that's not about picking up something and knocking the crap out of them, right? It's just, there were so many ways that, that as I talked to women over the years, that they found a way out, but it, but if someone was looking from the outside in, they'd think they were nuts. Yeah. They often do think that victims are nuts, but the reality is that they have found a really creative way 
to get to tomorrow morning to right. survive, to keep working towards a goal that that sometimes feels like it's down a long time. So the thing that happened for you, I think, was that that immediate recognition of the power that he had over you. And you just, it just got in for a minute and it is powerful, but, but the reality is you got to the other side of that and you finished your testimony and he got accountability for that attack on you. So that's the thing is that he did everything he could to try to stop you because he gave you that look and you know, the look, the power of that look, you know, what's behind it. You know, what the, what, what it means if you get that look. And for a minute, it triggered you to a place where you weren't anymore. And, and there's not, I, I, it, that's not uncommon. It's, that, that doesn't mean that there was anything wrong with you at the time. It doesn't mean that you hadn't made progress. It just meant that, wow, <laughs> there was a bump in the road and I tripped on it for a second, but I got back up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I could say that today, not back then, but yes. (laughs) And I think also probably a situation that makes my situation that's different from a lot of other folks is that when that attack happened that evening, I ran out and called and he was taken from that moment. And that was it for me. Then I, it was all about survival after that getting away or him leaving wasn't as difficult because it was, it all happened at the same, like in the same evening. Right. Again, it was the aftermath that it was the most difficult part because while those handcuffs are going on and they're being taken away, they're being taken away to a place where there's heat, there's lights, there's food, there's a bed, there's covers, there's everything that you need. They don't have expect- my unborn child and my eight year old with the electricity came turned off. Uh, I had no gas to put in my car. I had to stand in line and ask for food stamps. I had to wait. Very different, but we're not here to talk about my story. I just wanted to say that with that situation that I shared of being different, where it was an easy break for me personally, for a lot of women and or men, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And what I understand is that the moment your abuser has an idea that you're getting ready to leave, is Mm -hmm. when you are at a heightened risk for your safety all the way up until you actually do leave. And beyond that, actually, it, it, the thing that I, if I could get people to understand one thing about domestic violence is that leaving doesn't make you safe. Mm -hmm. Now for you, he was in custody. And so you didn't have to worry about him so much. But if you walk away and you're just trying to separate from your abuser and there's no one else who's holding them in some kind of uh, containment, they will continue to try to harass, stalk, abuse, coerce, manipulate you back. Um, They don't stop just because you're not in the physical space with them anymore. It may, in fact, escalate them to or uh, to more dangerous kinds of um, behaviors, to more violent behavior, to potentially killing you if you walk away. So leaving doesn't make you safe. Leaving, when people say, why didn't they just leave? It's I think victims of domestic violence are in the constant process of trying to leave safely. They are constantly looking for some strategy that will help them get away and get free. And those two things are different. Getting away and getting free are different. You can get away, but if they aren't willing to give up, if they aren't willing to stop focusing on you, you really can't control that. And so that's why when we ask women to get restraining orders, um, we have to follow through on what that means. We don't, as a society, universally implement consequences for violations of restraining orders. We demand that women get them, but then we don't do anything when they get violated. And they always get violated. They always get violated. Multiple times they get violated. And the police don't respond to that. And the judge doesn't yank them back into court and say, I gave you an order and you disobeyed it. And so now you're going to have a consequence. That doesn't happen. So Uh, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I, cause, because you're like, my hairs are standing up. I'm like, yeah, a big problem about that is when you get a restraining order, what is the number one thing you have to put on there? Your address, where to stay away from. Why can't it be just stay away from me instead of an address that I don't want you to know where I'm at? 
an address you have no business being around anyways. We're telling somebody not to come mm -hmm. find us, but we're handing them the address to come find us. That's why we developed what's called the Address Confidentiality Program in many states so that you can have an anonymous address and not be not be in trouble for trying to dodge people, right? So the state, the Secretary of State, the Attorney, I can't remember where, but in, in, in the states where the Address Confidentiality Program works, it's housed in a state agency, and that's where your real address is, but there's another address that you can give to your uh, credit card companies. Or that. So there, there were ways that we tried to address that and that it is um, in those kinds of cases where they feel like they need an anonymous address, that it is about you will not be within 200 feet or however many feet it is with a restraining order um, of this person and this kid's school and their workplace. And so it, it's a way to try to provide a, a, another level of protection, address to absolutely be confidential. That can happen in most states now. Um, that's right. And I really wanted to expand a little bit on that. It is called different things in different states. There mm -hmm. are a lot of different states actually do have it. The address confidentiality program, safe at home program, suppression unit. There's, there are a lot of different programs or excuse me, states that are out there offering this program through the Secretary mm -hmm. of State, as you mentioned. And I personally am still an active participant 20 years later. I'm in it. I'm still in it. I will never get out of it. I really do appreciate what it does and how it does make me feel like I have an additional layer of safety. And, mm -hmm. you know, for the listeners, I also want to say that, you know, to Rita's point, there are things that are available for the school districts as well. And both of us have the passion of safety here, okay, for parents and children. If you're in that program or you're just now hearing about the program, make sure that you tap into what's available for those, for your children, because it's like bright neon, yellow, pink, purple, green colored piece of cardboard paper that goes in the school file. So it definitely sticks out. Yes, they still use paper in schools. <laughs> and if not, then you just ask the person, yay, hey, flag my account in the electronic system where your information is kept confidential even there as well. Okay. And right. that's extremely important because when you have that documentation and you're providing it to the schools and you're communicating these concerns, that's an additional protective layer. That's a, a team working with you to protect your child. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, so I, thank you for bringing that up. I didn't even think about that. And it's so important for sure. Yeah. And like you said earlier, moving, why don't they just move out? Yeah. Moving out is a physical thing. That's probably the easiest thing out of everything to do is move out. It's the moving on. What do you do after you move out? It's almost like it's, and for people who are in states that start on fire, it's almost like getting that knock on your door and they say the fire is two miles away. You have five minutes to leave. Right. And when you come back, your house is going to be ashes only. Okay. Right. What items do you grab in those five minutes? What are the priorities immediately in your head? Because for those people that have not been through a form of domestic violence, hopefully they can understand that layman term that I just offered because that's pretty much what it is. Mm -hmm. When somebody is trying to escape real time from an, an extreme abusive situation, or they just know it's the time to go, they yeah. have five, seven minutes tops to hurry up and go. That's one of the reasons why we wrote an article about that for domesticshelters.org. We actually have information about, so I want to leave now. What do I, so it's a way to create your go bag, so to speak, and a, a go bag that you might leave somewhere else, not in your house. If you have a safe place to to leave it, it's children's birth certificates. And if you're married, your wedding certificate and all kinds of social security card and medical information, and all the kinds of things that you would need to set up shop somewhere else. That's right. Um, and then cash, stashing cash somewhere so that you have the ability to at least function for a few days. All of that is in in our in an article, at least one article we've put together at Domestic Shelters to help people understand that you, you don't want to try to figure this out when you're in crisis. You want to have this ready to go for if it becomes necessary. And that's the the whole point is getting people to think through their strategies when they're not in crisis, when they're not terrified, because it's easier for them to create a, a plan that will probably have a better chance of succeeding <clears throat> than if you're terrified and you're hurt and the kids are terrified and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, 
planning ahead of time is the goal. And uh, we want to make sure that they put as much into that as possible, creating their own safety plan, knowing what they're going to do, who they're going to call, how they're going to, where they're going to stay, if there's a shelter nearby, that all that information, have that ready to go if you find a way to get out. Yeah, exactly. And like we mentioned earlier, that time is the most riskiest. And mm -hmm. so it's extremely important to, I agree with Rita, having that somewhere else, whether it's a gym locker, a library, <laughs> asking yeah. a friend to hold it down. If you're taking something out of the house, one thing every single day, so it's not so obvious. At Confronting Domestic Violence, our mission is to provide real-time resources to real-time victims and survivors and offer relocation services if they have a safe place to go, but not the means to get there. And mm -hmm. some of my coaching as well, when somebody calls, because by the mm -hmm. time they're calling me, they're ready. We're not mm -hmm. talking about what do you think? How do you feel? Are you, do you think you're ready to go? You're ready to go and it's time to make these arrangements. And I coach the same way. I said, listen, wash the dishes, clean the laundry, do like you would do normally, but just shift some things around in the drawer. Because mm -hmm. when the movers show up, they're just going to pull the drawers out of, out of the dresser and take that as is because we don't want to risk your safety. We want to make sure that your safety is held up first and foremost and give you the ways to not make it seem staged, even though it is staged. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Also, one of the things that I wanted to share with you is I want to ask you, I want to ask your opinion first. Okay. <laughs> For most survivors, when they're getting ready to leave, or if they're not, if they're just still in their situation and they know they are, but they haven't crossed that bridge yet of figuring out what are their options, right? Because when you acknowledge, that's great. But if you don't know what your options are, it's really hard to make a choice. And if you can't make a choice, then you can't not take action. That's it's doesn't it sounds simple. It's not. OK, so when you are in that space of what I just said, whether you're acknowledging or you're ready to figure out your options, where is the number one place that you go more often than anywhere else other than home? Where else are you most of the time other than home for most parents? For most people, it's work if they're working. Yeah, exactly. At work. And I'm glad you answered that because I didn't want to assume that's my answer too. And, you know, so many of us go to work because that's a safer place for us mm -hmm. because work has amenities that we can use because work can be a place where we make it our own safe space. And like I was saying earlier, we could leave personal stuff there. I'm not sure if you've heard about the new legislative law that passed in California, SB 553. SB 553 is a workplace violence prevention plan that's requiring most California organizations to have in place. The time frame has already lapsed. July 1st was when it went into effect and when organizations were expected to be compliant. Obviously, the, the bill is pretty murky and there's a lot of companies that are still seeking to be compliant. And what's most interesting is that it's a bill that's enforcing or that's holding Cal OSHA to enforce. So now Cal OSHA has to understand the bill in order to enforce the bill. And companies are scrambling because the murkiness around domestic violence prevention, reporting, and responding is now their responsibility. For police officers, domestic violence being one of the most riskiest calls to go to, now we're looking at corporations to be first responders. Interesting. Yes, very interesting. So now with companies asking employees to come back to work post-COVID, mm -hmm. those people that left before COVID are not the same people that are coming back post-COVID. And COVID has pushed the needle as it relates to the statistics of domestic violence that has increased since then. So more than likely, domestic violence spillover is going to happen at work before a chemical spill. Right? It is a place where harm is potential because it's one of the places that an abuser knows their victim will be, right? 
it's at work and they know their hours. And so it becomes a place where they can be targeted, which makes other employees unsafe. <clears throat> Yeah, I remember people being stalked at work and asking to be escorted. A lot of the places of worship, actually, the mm -hmm. Sutherland, Sutherland Springs, Sutherland Hills, Texas. Texas. That was, yeah, that was three generations of a family. And the gunman, this was over a domestic violence dispute. He was looking for his the, the woman. Yeah. And, sure and when she he didn't called go to church them, that day, exactly, because he called them that morning and made the threat and they chose not to tell anybody and they chose not to go to church and they were unharmed. She yeah. was. But I think she had family members who were actually murdered in that massacre. Yeah, you know, there was a lot. Learned... That day. I'm sorry. A lot of people died that day. A lot of people. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I was actually, I actually went there in person and was there when they were going in with their white hazmat suits. So it was very sad and definitely a lot of lessons learned from that incident, specifically from the DV side and in the say something, see something, say something approach. If you're observing mm -hmm. behaviors that don't seem right, that are rubbing you the wrong way, you're feeling this instinctive thing ne of negative, of maybe fear or just your intuition of something is not right. Speak up and say something. Maybe other people will then say, oh my gosh, yes. Okay. I was feeling the same thing or seeing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. As a community coming together to for joyful things, we need to come together for the not so joyful things too, to still make that difference and prevent, mitigate, respond together. <laughs> oh. So for for over a hundred, for over what three over two hundred years, over over three hundred years, we've been really trying to bring domestic violence awareness to the forefront. I have on here since 1641, the body of liberty, liberties of Massachusetts Bay declared a married woman should be free from bodily correction of, or stripes by her husband. 1641. We have been dealing with this for so long. It is so time. It is so right now time for <clears throat> just an influx of change for programs and resources to be available for people to speak up and really share what their needs are. When your circumstances change, so do your needs. Maybe with SB 553 coming into effect and companies now being holding the reality to be a first responder and a preventer, mitigator, all of that. Hopefully, I'm hoping that some additional resources will now start coming into the workplace so that people do not fear speaking up and talking about what they might need help with. A lot of EAP programs offer maybe five mental health sessions. They offer assistance for gamblers, porn addicts, alcohol abuse. Seeing something in there for real-time victims would be, I think, a very beneficial thing for both parties, the employer and the employee. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm really looking forward to seeing some serious changes. And I think, I know that California is a leading state when it comes to public privacy and safety under that DV umbrella. So I'm hoping that this is going to spread like wildfire and that all states, you know, need to really think about this and implement some sort of program within yeah, the dominoes fall in equally. <laughs> yeah, usually when one one state passes a law, others try to implement some form of it in their states. If it's a good law, if it's starting to make a difference. So there will be other states, I think, that will try to replicate it in some fashion. Depending on who the legislature is, it, it could be a good replication or a really bad one. <laughs> Just, depend <laughs> yeah. on. Just depend on who's who are the legislators in a state. So you really have to figure out what's the best way to implement, or maybe it's not this particular group of legislators. We have to wait until we change a few of them kind of thing. Yeah, But most state coalitions who do this work are pretty keyed in and carry the bills into the state house in ways that will do the least amount of damage if there are people who would make bad decisions about these kinds of laws. So yeah, we try to learn from each other. Somebody who gets a law passed that really is starting to make a difference. Others start to say, hey, how do we do that here? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which I hope will be something. I've done a lot of research and really right now before the bill was passed, it really is up to the company. If they want that to be a part of their culture, then they implement it. And if not, then not. I've done a lot more research. I know that it's like billions of dollars that are spent on, on an annual basis just to 
respond and recover opposed to be proactive and preventative. That can be another podcast for another day all in itself. (laughs) I'm sure. (laughs) And I guess I just want to, I want to feel like we've gone full circle. We've talked about the tremendous amount of work that you have done to really help implement programs and legislative bills, laws, requirements, programs, you name it for a very long time. And With that being said, going into now that actual DV community, the the actual people suffering or trying to cope or dealing with this on their own, we have dealt with real-time victims where, and and I'm speaking for myself at the moment, I've dealt with real-time victims where they are calling and they're in the woods crying hysterically. I can barely understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to bring them to a level where they are breathing normally. And then I speak to them about getting into their logic space. I understand that you're feeling this. I know that it's chaotic. I know that you are feeling like everything is shattered and in shambles around you. But logically speaking, what do you have at your fingertips right now? And what that has helped me really identify and answering these calls is that when you're in that space, it's hard to think straight because I'm so far removed of my 20 years ago situation. Trust me, I'm in survival mode still 20 years later, but (laughs) yeah, but being so removed from that real time, when I'm speaking to these real time individuals, it reminds me of how chaotic your thoughts are and how it's really hard to be logical because you're so devastated and you're so much in your emotions. And I'm sorry for repeating myself, but I am. I think this is where domesticshelters.org really comes into play because that's one of the immediate places I tell them to go Hmm. for whatever they need right now. And I said it earlier, when your circumstances stances change, then so do your needs. So I am so happy to be a part of domesticshelters.org. So happy to know that there's a directory there that really allows people to get what they, you know, think they need at that time at their fingertips, which is why it's so important to build this community like you and I have started and you have been doing for many years where we become like a full circle service where if somebody calls one of us, we can at least point them in a direction that will help them, even if we can't do it directly. Yeah, it takes a huge variety of services at, for people to to get what they need at a different moment in time. Because as you grow, as you start to stabilize, as you start to find ways uh, to not have crisis every minute, then, then your needs change and different services. So emergency shelter is one of the places that people may need to go initially because they're just so terrified and they're, and they just don't have uh, enough money to get their own place. So you start wherever you are and you build on that, on that foundation and different services then, whether you need legal advocacy or you need to find housing or you need to get some education because you're not going to make enough otherwise. So you need to go back into school. And there are programs, there are scholarships for women who have been victims of domestic violence specifically. And so there are lots of resources available out there. And I think that it takes all of us at the different levels that we provide services at to help people take that journey because it's not just a, okay, I'm out and now I'm done. There's a lot of work that has to be done to get past the recovery into the thriving stage. And And you are reading my mind right now because I say, do we have enough time to talk about that cycle or should that be another podcast? And I'm like, you know what? You just let us right into it. So it's here. And thank you, number one, for, for even putting that out there because I think it's really important for listeners and people who maybe just don't know yet that there is a full cycle and that cycle does not happen immediately. It's not an overnight thing. There are so many steps and it, and my personal opinion, it really starts with the headspace. The faster that you can forgive yourself and, or the other person, 
then the faster you can start on your healing process because the devastation, regardless if it's two years, 20 years that you've been in that situation, it takes about two years to uncondition the mind, the brain that was constantly in this toxic environment where your belief system was altered to the negative, where mm -hmm. your inner critic is hurting you and damaging you more than hearing anything critical from the outside. The ripple effect after moving out, which is the easiest part sometimes, is the moving on. And mm -hmm. yeah, what does that cycle circle from your knowledge and wisdom and boots on the ground, what typically on an average does that look like? One, two, three, five years? I think it depends on how much, how much damage and trauma has been done, how much you've been betrayed on just the basic core level of a human being. It's the worst kind of violation to claim you love someone and to hurt them that deeply. Um, and so it, it's important to understand that damage is real and it doesn't make you unusual and it doesn't make you bad. It just means that someone was very focused on tearing you down so that you couldn't get back up. That was the goal. And they are the abusers are very good at succeeding at that, at really crushing you to the point where you don't even have the will to get up. But, but so many women do. They just do. They just keep getting back up. And that's the part for me. I have so much respect for the people who do, um, who manage to get their kids to school on time and get to work and continue to function in that kind of toxic teardown that happens on a regular basis. It, the timing is different for everybody. There's not a, there's not a path or a time frame that has to work that as long as it takes you is how long as it takes you, right? It's, there's no framework that you have to be paying attention to. You do what you can do, the piece you keep chipping away at it. And just because you get triggered doesn't mean you've lost all that ground. It just means that you had a moment where it's, whoa, okay. Yeah, that was a horrible time and I'm doing okay right? I'm doing okay now. So I think for me, it's that. It's really recognizing that the time frame is your time frame and you do it according to how you can do it. That's right. And I love that you answered it just the way you did. It couldn't have been any more perfect because that is for every single person to hear that your situation is unique because you are unique. No situation is the same. There are steps that are pretty common, which is what we've mentioned, emotional support, the mental support, and having the clarity to prioritize what your needs are. But at the end, there really is no formula that specifies, okay, in six months, you're going to be great. One year, you're going to be great. Each and every one of us is unique. And so is our situation. But the one thing that brings us all together is the one thing that we really believe in, and that is you do not have to suffer alone, nor do you have to go through this alone. And there really, truly is a brighter light at the other side. There really is. And really quickly, for me, it was over 10 years. I needed to have surgeries because of the situation that I, the body parts I had to use to fight them off of me. I need to have surgical repair to those body parts. So mm -hmm. when I'm on recovery from something that I survived 10 years ago and it's me in the ceiling, those thoughts and the, all those things are coming back. So it really is a thing called post-traumatic growth. And mm -hmm. that is when you become a wiser, stronger individual from your trauma. What you learned is making you wiser. What you learned is making you stronger. What you learned is helping you build your boundaries. It's making you a more confident person. Maybe you want to teach your kids some life lessons from that. When you really turn that negative into something positive and you can grow from it, that's the definition of post traumatic growth. And to your point earlier, all these women that keep on getting up and going, sometimes it's mechanical. Sometimes that's better when it's mechanical, then it's you don't have to feel anything you're just going and doing. But all in all, it, it really, really focused on the coping skills is what's going to take you further. And one more thing that I want to say about my personal story is that when I was mechanical, when I was just doing what needed to get done, and then my 
hyper focus was just on providing and protecting. When my daughter became an adult and left the house, she said, mom, as much as I love you and you were that helicopter mom, so much so that I couldn't get away with anything, I love and respect you, but you were not emotionally available for me. And that crushed me because my love language is of actions and by me protecting and providing, that was like everything. So I just want to share that with parents who might be listening that it's really important to teach your kids emotional intelligence, even if you feel like you're struggling with your own at the moment, because they're always watching. Mm -hmm. And even if you're deciding not to teach the great things, they are watching what may be not the great things and they're still learning. So. Yeah, it, that's a very true thing. And and it's also hard when you're just functioning at a level of getting through the day to be as available for the people who depend on you as you want to be. So that, that takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of support. So when you can find it, find a way to open that door again, but it's scary to do it because you've been hurt by somebody who claimed to care about you. And so there's a lot of protective behaviors that happen, I think, for people as they start to recover. And it makes perfect sense that you would have that wall up in some respects. But how do you do that and also maintain your connection to your kids that's authentic? And that is a hard part. That is really a hard thing to do. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> it really is. And I know we're coming up on our time and I love that you speak decided to spend some precious time with me and be on here and just really share your wisdom and your experience. And I hope to see you at the gala on October 27th at the Del Mar Social in Del Mar. It's our first fundraising event, which you already know. Thank you for supporting us and putting us on your social media platforms. We're hoping it's going to be a great turnout. And I would just, if you want to leave like a wounds to wisdom or just a wisdom statement or something in, in, inspirational, empowering for our listeners. That would be beautiful. I, what I would probably say is that I want you to give yourself as much grace as you give other people. You yes. deserve to be recognized for the power and the courage that it took for you to get through this. Um, so give yourself that grace. Um, and recognize that we can always grow, we can always learn, but that's something that you did that most people probably couldn't. Thank you for that. Yeah. And to just to piggyback a little bit on what Rita said right there, I'm going to take it just a teeny tiny bit higher. Everything she just said, do it in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Do it in the mirror. Look at yourself. Tell yourself that you're giving yourself grace, that you love yourself, that you believe in yourself, that this is a right. phase and that, like a season, it's going to change. That's right. That's great. I love that addition. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Mere neurons are a real deal. Yeah. Look it up. It's scientifically proven. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Rita, thank you so much for all that you have done, all that you're still doing for the legacy that you created, the legacy you're leaving behind, the community that has been served and is going to be served. Thank you so much for everything you have done in this community under this umbrella. You are an amazing, beautiful woman. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. A happy to be here. I'm really glad to, to participate because yeah, people were very gracious in sharing their knowledge with me and their life with me. And um, I feel a responsibility to pay it forward. I'm going to call you back. <laughs> I am more than happy to give any information or use this space to, if you want people to find you, if you want to put out any links, I can just also put it on like the, the credits at the end, if you want, whatever you want. Yeah. I'm, people can find me on LinkedIn if they want to do that. That's where I'm most, most easily found, I think is on LinkedIn. If people want more information, they can find me there. Okay. And I will include your link. Okay. Do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our mission at Confronting Domestic Violence, CDV, is to provide real-time resources to real-time victims and offer relocation services when parents have a safe place to go and not the means to get there. Every day, countless families wake up in fear 
navigating a battleground in their own home, trapped in a cycle of violence. It is a known fact the most dangerous time for a victim is when the abuser knows they're leaving right up to the point of leaving. One of the biggest challenges a parent faces is fear and finances. So while we aim to help numerous families each month by fostering multi-agency collaborations, we're humbly asking you for your support too. Every little bit helps to make our mission a reality for families ready to leave their toxic, abusive environment. No parent should have to leave everything behind or result to homelessness when leaving for safety. Your contribution can make a world of difference in offering a family to feel safe at home once again.